Thank you very much for coming this evening. I'm Mark Irvin. Um, I will be uh, asking General Jackson some questions. Uh, clearly, I've tried to tailor them to what I assume will be the, uh, the interests of a seething mass of hacks and correspondents and people. I see one or two non-journalistic people in here too, so we'll, we'll throw in some more general ones about the army. Uh, it's going to be one of those evenings. Um, I thought I'd start off, Mike, by asking you uh, about uh, the, the Bloody Sunday period, because it was a very significant period early in your career, not because I want to take you through uh, Bloody Sunday, because I know that's a, a difficult issue in its own right, but to ask you about journalists in, in Northern Ireland at that time um, what was your view of them, uh, particularly after an event like Bloody Sunday, which within the Parachute Regiment was a very emotive and difficult time, uh, uh, and did it in, in, in a way condition your view of journalists um, or, 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 or form it? Perhaps a bit of both, um, because Northern Ireland uh, was the first time, of course, that the British Army went on operations, first of all on domestic United Kingdom territory uh, and, uh, and, and secondly um, in a way which was really open for the first time I think to uh, modern media reporting um, before 69 Northern Ireland, remember 1968 there's something very um, unique about that year in milit British military history it is the only post-war year when no British soldier was killed on operations. Extraordinary to think about that, but, but there we are. Because 67 was the last withdrawal from Aden, if I remember rightly. Um, uh, and those funny little end, end of empire wars, if that's the right word, the Middle East Aden, Borneo confrontation, um, Mama Kenya before that, they were not exposed to the media in the same way at all. And then comes Northern Ireland. First of all, it's very close. Secondly, as I've said, part of the territory of the United Kingdom. And for the first time, I think, um, the army and, and uh, the fourth estate um, had to work out their relationships one with another. Um, for myself, um, and I think, I hope most people would know that from me, uh, or from the way I've, I've done things, that... Um, you are part of the modern world and for any military person to try and, and do the uh, Duva over the head act is frankly um, not going to work um, there will be friction yes um, that's inevitable but it, it, it's a relationship which both sides uh, I think um, have matured into since those very early days um, when you've got a lot of hacks on the streets of, of Belfast in particular um, and everything the army was doing was open to the gaze both the eye and the camera and the notebook um, of the fourth estate and that's where I think this whole new relationship if I can put it that way began I remember uh, Robert Fox uh, telling me a story about being assigned as a reporter during the Cod War, which I don't know how many of you remember the brief uh, confrontation between the UK and Iceland over fishing rights. And um, he, he said to me uh, that... Uh, a, ma a matter of considerable strategic importance. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember this story because um, it comes back to handling of the press, the, the 70s... You know, whether people in the forces had an idea what to do. The, the captain of the frigate that Robert was sent to was introduced to him. Yes, Robert Fox, Captain so-and-so. And then a, a third person introduced himself as the, um, as the minder, the civil servant from the MOD, who'd been sent along to look after Robert while he was on the frigate. And the captain said, well, I'm very pleased to have you aboard, Mr. Fox, and turned to the minder and said, what are we going to do about arsehole? <laughs> <laughs> now... I just wonder if the, uh, the Navy how... were rather blunter in those days. <laughs> I just wonder to what extent people in the Army had a slightly more evolved view of, uh, of PR, even if you like information warfare. We used to hear about that in the 70s in the, in the Northern Ireland context. But to, 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 to sum it up about whether 
the press could be turned to the purpose of helping the campaign rather than hindering what you were trying to do there. Well, I know such a thought would be anathema to, uh, to uh, uh, just about everybody um, in the profession. Um, but, but I think, as, as I said, said a moment ago, both sides learnt by this. Um, the, the Fourth Estate learned much more about how the arm, army operated and began to understand it, because it's very important you all do that. Um, and there's not, there's, if I've got one sort of criticism at the moment, um, there is far too much megaphone positions being taken, and, uh, and, and uh, au contraire, um, not a lot of understanding from time to time. Um, so it grew. I mean, that relationship grew from there. Um, and, of course, uh, at the beginning uh, in Northern Ireland, we also suddenly realized just how good, you know, you put a young soldier uh, on, on the screen, um, and he, he just carries utter conviction. Um, what happened? You know, where were we? Well, I was coming down the street, and that bugger shot at me from up there, etc., etc. And it has an absolute ring of, ring of honesty. Um, but I think what you were getting at, Mark, really was the nervousness of the body politic when it comes to people in uniform um, in front of a camera or a microphone or whatever the case may be, uh, and, and the sort of neuralgia which, which requires minders to be around. Um, um, it doesn't show a lot of trust. I accept that entirely. Um, and uh, I think it's somewhat indicative um, of a reluctance to allow the armed services to speak for themselves when it is appropriate to do so. I want to sort of zap through a, a few campaigns uh, because clearly they helped to develop the, the media military picture, the Falklands, the 91 Gulf War, but, but you were not centrally involved in those and, and come to the issue of the, of the Balkans, um, which is, I suppose, where you really exploded onto the public stage with the Kosovo operation. Um, and indeed Bosnia. I mean, clearly a very different picture there. Um, a lot of reporters engaged on the ground in reporting what was happening in Sarajevo, other places. Um, and to what extent do you think by that point, 24-hour news, reports of atrocities, uh, bread queue massacres, all this kind of thing, were, were driving policy? That's a very, uh, very profound question, um, because sometimes... The argument goes, does it not, that that what you see on your television screen is arguably news of itself, but it's also of itself making news. It, it, the very fact it's been broadcast and things have been seen, um, which, are, which otherwise or in previous times would not have been seen. But you know, it was a strange, strange period, was it not, though, the, the early 90s, middle 90s, because you know, we had the end of the Cold War, um, peace breaking out everywhere, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, slightly premature, perhaps with the benefit of hindsight. Um, uh, and off comes the lid of the pressure cooker, pressure release, and all of a sudden we discover that we've been sitting on long-standing ethnic, regional, religious, uh, old historical enmities, which all of a sudden burst up and started in Europe's back door. Um, um, you know, Jacques Pousse, slightly improbably named, you might say, um, who I think was foreign minister of Luxembourg at the time, and Luxembourg had the presidency of the EU, who said now is the hour of Europe. Um, well, it wasn't really. Um, well, but that was the best they could do. It wasn't too good. Um, but, you know, Bosnia got, got bad, uh, terrible things were done, but it took three years to 95 to we cannot go on like this and yes a lot of journalists um, were in Bosnia uh, were able to report um, some of the appalling atrocities being perpetrated by all three factions although not necessarily in the same same proportion um, and I think to some extent um, that reporting did help bring the matter to a head as it had to be in the London Conference of July, I think it was, 95, when my old friend Rupert Smith uh, put on the table his famous fork in the road paper. 
you can do one of two things. You can muddle through like this um, for not much longer, and then you will have to get out. Or you can take the initiative and use force, proper force, to bring the matter to a point where the factions have to concede. Um, and that led us to Dayton. I wonder how much of a, a, a culture clash or a, or a clash of, of world views, of philosophies there was at the time uh, between people like Rupert Smith yourself uh, and politicians like Tony Blair and uh, Clinton who were incredibly fluent in, 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 in politics, in crisis management, in dealing with, with this type of issue, but who at other times seemed to either not understand the most basic principles of military force or deliberately wish to, to reinterpret them. I'll give you two examples. Um, Tony Blair in the run-up to the Kosovo War uh, saying, uh, we have to be prepared to threaten force. Uh, we may even have to use it uh, without realizing the, 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 the idea that you couldn't credibly threaten to use force unless you were absolutely prepared to use it. And then Clinton, when, when the campaign actually started, going on telly and saying, we will not have a ground campaign, uh, saying we're launching airstrikes, but ruling out an escalatory step that I think most strategists would have regarded as an absolutely basic thing that you keep there available to yourself as a military option and not rule out on the first night of the war. So th the basic question would be, uh, with political leadership like that clearly extremely impressive in various respects, uh, do you feel they understood uh, how to use force and bring about a successful outcome in the Balkans? Well, um, we've moved really from Bosnia to Kosovo in time frame because, of course, Tony Blair was not Prime Minister during Bosnia. When was Clinton elected? Somebody will know. Um, was it... Sorry? 93. Yeah, thanks. So he, he did see... Um, Bosnia, and, and, and there's no doubt that to get Dayton done, it took American heavy lifting to do that. Um, uh, but moving to Kosovo, um, yeah, um, the United States was still, in my view, in the aftermath way back of Vietnam and arguably Mogadishu. Uh, where the whole body bag issue was um, a, a political no-no. Um, and, and I think that wasn't just President Clinton's view of himself, him, um, by, uh, in his own view. Um, I think he was reflecting a sense in the American body politic, and he's got very good antenna, I think, there. Um, and I mean, this charitable view of, of, of Clinton over Kosovo is that he had to keep his own electorate on board and therefore don't take him down this road too obviously too fast. But equally well, he was prepared and the majority of the aircraft used in the air campaign against Milosevic were American aircraft. That's a matter of fact. And he was having to straddle these two political considerations. As time moved on, he shifted his position, of course. I think the, the critical phrase he used, if I remember rightly, in about May, early May, was uh, no options are ruled out, without actually saying anything, anything about ground. Um, closer to home, it was, of course, for um, Tony Blair's government, the first occasion on which he had to make a decision to, to pursue political objectives um, via the use of military force. Uh, and um, in 99, um, I think uh, it would be hard, I hope, to disagree with me when I say, without doubt, he was the leading Western political leader to bring Kosovo to the conclusion that we did. And when there were rumours going around that if the Americans wouldn't commit on the ground, Britain was going to raise 50,000 ground troops and call up the TA? Not and either or. Would, would Britain have gone that far, do you think, to, to broaden? You know, I think we would, actually. And it's not an either-or, because we could not have raised sufficient numbers to give you the confidence that you were going to win alone. So it would have, it would have had to have been in concert, um, not only with the Americans, 
uh, with the other NATO allies as well. But um, the crucial question was, you know, if it has to come to it, because we were faced, you know, middle of May, the clock was ticking over time, uh, Bosnian winter, um, sorry, Balkan winter, nearly half a million refugees in flimsy tents. I mean, it would have been awful if they were still in flimsy tents come November, December. Um, and so the thing had to be brought to a conclusion um, before the onset of real winter. Um, and military logic is inexorable there. You know, if, 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 if he's not going to concede by an air campaign alone, we're going to have to go in on the ground. Or else we go home with our tails between our legs and goodbye NATO. I would, I, I, that would be my view if that had happened. NATO could not have withstood the shock of basically a withdrawal. And when you went in, there, there was the famous or infamous episode of the race to the airport, the Russians. Were, were, was Wesley There's a minor tactical detail, I think. <laughs> was Wesley Clark asking you to start World War III? Um, I mean, when you reflect on that now... Um, I remember you saying at a press conference, you're obsessed with the Russians to us. You're but, I mean, obsessed with the airport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we were asking you about it. So uh, were, were we right to ask that many questions? Was it, was it a touchstone issue of confidence between yourself and Wesley Clark? Ah, no, we're getting onto thin ice here. Because um, um, I, I have to be uh, just a little bit careful because um, uh, my life and times will, will hit the bookshops in early September. <laughs> And Transworld, my publishers, uh, are probably will lock me up if I give too much away uh, at this point. Um, suffice it to say that uh, there had been a large Russian contingent in Bosnia for several years. Um, quite right. Russia is still a major player on the world stage. And uh, it's important that they see that we understand that. It was um, absolutely inevitable that we had expected it, that there would be a Russian contingent um, in K4. It was just the manner and timing of their arrival was just a... Uh, <laughs> but it, was, it was good fun. And whatever was happening between capitals, uh, on the ground we were able to actually integrate that force um, without too much trouble at all. And I'll say no more for now. It's, um, it's all in Chapter 11, actually. Well, we can't deny you a, a quick plug, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I, I want to go forward a bit more now, because clearly I'm, I'm mindful of, of the clock ticking. Um, you, you had a situation uh, uh, pre-Iraq pre where Tony Blair had been Prime Minister during a number of uh, military... Expeditions, obviously, you, you've got Kosovo, Sierra Leone. Leone, Sierra Leone, Macedonia. We forget that small but crucial operation lasted about six weeks in which, Macedonia, which prevented Macedonia, frankly, from splitting uh, between uh, um, the, the, the Orthodox religion, Orthodox uh, Macedonians, and the Albanian origin Macedo Macedonians. We forget it, but it was a very neat little operation. Yes, indeed, uh, and, and indeed, I remember Vaughan telling me his plans to, uh, to launch this club while we were bouncing around in an armoured vehicle covering those six weeks of, uh, of operations there. What I wanted to ask is about that period, but you have a Prime Minister who at this point, presumably, whatever he's thought of the British forces before those expeditions, is getting the idea that they can get it together, they can deliver results, uh, they can crudely make him look good uh, or, or empower him on the international stage and are a great asset. But at the same time, you have a public spending climate in which the, the pinch on resources is getting greater and greater. I'm going to tell a story slightly out of, out of school here about a certain uh, service chief at the time who, who told me that he'd gone to remonstrate with Tony Blair. And Tony Blair said, well, you know, I think you're doing a great job. Um, <laughs> and and the, service, the, the service chief had replied, that's all very well, but we need more money. So he basically, so apparently the PM said, well, go and see Gordon. Um, well, he went to see Gordon, and Gordon immediately tried to take the fight to him by saying, I oh, you've been saying I know nothing about defence. <laughs> um, to which the service chief replied, that's not quite right, Charles. I said, you know fucking nothing about defence. <laughs> now, 
I've no idea who you're talking about. But I, but I think his Christian name is Charles. I'm yeah. wrong. I mean, d- did you feel that? Did you feel that you had a Prime Minister who appreciated what you were doing, but you still had a public spending climate which expected the forces to do all these things with less and less money? Some of you may have had nothing better to do, I think, on the 6th of December than to watch me on the Dimbleby lecture. I mean, if, you, if that was the best thing you would have done with your evening, bad luck is all I can say. Um, but, but, yeah, I try to address this point. Um, there is no doubt that the British Armed Forces, and the, the Army in particular, without being, uh, I hope, um, too cocky about it, um, have been asked to do things in the last... Where are we? 15 years, since, since the beginning of Bosnia, in the last 15 years, which um, uh, on a duration and a tempo which is unprecedented, uh, unless you go back to the so-called em- end of empire at the end of the 60s when the army was nearly twice the size it is today. Um, and um, I think uh, Bosnia, yes, we did a good job. Um, uh, but, of course, Bosnia was sullied by the inability of the so-called that homogeneous lot, the international community, um, to, to grip it uh, for three years. Um, but then once, grip, once Dayton was in place, uh, Bosnia started to, to get back on its feet and with a bit of luck where it came now. Mm. Um, but Britain paid its part. We, we were... Uh, leading a division, I just happen to be the bloke running it, um, of three. Um, so we played quite a big part in Bosnia. It worked. But that was before 97, before the change of government. 99 comes Kosovo. Um, yeah, politically um, difficult. Um, we've, we've spoken about the, where the Americans came from on it. Um, for some of the European NATO members, you know, actually, you know, dropping things which exploded um, was quite a psychological jump. Um, <laughs> and somebody might get hurt. Well, yeah, that's what you're doing it for. Um, um, so, um, what I think, if I had been in Tony Blair's shoes, I, I would have said, right, we, we took a risk. We, we did it for the right reasons. We took a risk. It worked. We, we achieved our political objectives via the use of force, and in which the British Armed Forces for Kosovo, I would argue, played a leading role rather than a, a one-third role. Um, well, that starts to give you confidence, does it not? You know, these people can do this. Um, you know, the banal phrase, you know, you read the label on the tin, open the tin, and what's in it is what's on the label, and that is where your armed forces are with a slight exception of a small little naval misadventure recently, but, but we'll leave that to one side. Um, um, so I, th- I think your point, I- your point I- is very well made. Um, and I wouldn't want either. Um, it, you never see it mentioned in the press these days. But the operation we conducted in May 2000 in Sierra Leone was uh, an absolute, to me, perfect example of the, the almost surgical use of military force to prevent a political outcome which would have been disaster. It was pretty awful anyway. Anybody who's seen Blood Diamond, as I'm sure most people in this room have, will know what I'm talking about. Um, and, 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 and that was <laughs> with a UN force in Sierra Leone, I think of 17 and a half thousand. Um, uh, uh, it didn't need, even take 10% of that. I think the British force, which, which actually did what it had to do in those critical days, was around 1,000. But, uh, ladies will forgive me, they had the balls to get stuck in and do what they had to do. Long may it be so. So, why couldn't you get more money out of the Chancellor? Oh, I'm sorry, the money bet. <laughs> Well, well, after that sterling performance no, no. of airborne spirit in Sierra Leone. I, I wasn't trying to avoid the question. I was just getting, getting carried away with um, 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 just, just what um, a good army can do when it's, when it's used in the right way. Um, the money problem. Um, 
It is at the end of the day um, a strategic decision of, of the highest order as to how much of the public purse to spend on which function of the state. Um, and it's an intensely political uh, process because um, making there is no um, sort of paradigm that I know where you can make a judgment as between how much to spend on defence, health, education, roads, whatever. Um, these are political. Um, they're not arithmetical. Um, and um, the old, old cry, you know, um, there ain't no votes in defence. Um, and sadly, sadly, I think there's a huge amount of truth in that. At the last election, was defence an issue? No, not in the slightest. Um, was Iraq an issue? Yes. But, but the connection between the two is not really made. Um, and, um, yeah, I, 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 I think this government, and I said, said it at, at the Dimbleby lecture, have not actually balanced off what they have asked us to do and what we have done as against uh, just, just, just a little more. It wouldn't need a lot, in my view, 10%, maybe 15% on $32 billion. $32 billion, huge amount of money. Um, the government is spent, spent last fiscal year $550 billion. 32 is not a huge number when set in the right context. And I say another three, three and a bit would probably sort it out. Um, so I wait with bated breath. You're quite right. The Prime Minister said the army can have anything it wants. Um, but the blank cheque, of course, uh, is not signed by him. It's signed by still his next door neighbour, um, but, but about to be you know, musical chairs in Dining Street. We'll see how we go. I'm just taking you now to the, the approach of the Iraq war, um, uh, clearly there are certain political decisions which are, are not in, in the purview of service chiefs, but there are two things which I've heard persistently talked about uh, as, as being things that, that rattled around in Whitehall in the, in the weeks and days before that uh, operation was launched. The first is the question of legal advice and, and, and how confident you were that, uh, that what the orders you would be giving would be lawful in that sense of, of, of being uh, legally buttressed. The second is the issue of the so-called uh, phase four planning, which uh, uh, for those uninitiated with the military process, essentially this, this was the question of what was going to happen after Saddam was toppled. Uh, I've heard it said that, that the British Armed Forces formally represented uh, their dismay with the lack of phase four planning to the Americans uh, prior to the war. So I wondered if you could just sort of set the record straight on those two issues. What was your feeling about the legal advice and, and is it true that uh, formal reservations or questions were, were put across about phase four and, and that the service chiefs were unhappy in the UK? We have got about three and a half hours yet, <laughs> I, I, I'm told. Um, legality. Very interesting. Kosovo, about which we've spoken, was of course uh, a use of force by NATO without a UN Security Council resolution. Um, so indeed uh, was the campaign against Saddam Hussein. Um, but people... NATO. I'm sorry? It wasn't NATO. What wasn't NATO? The, the campaign against Saddam No, I said against Kosovo. Sorry, if I didn't make that clear, let's try again. The military action was taken against Milosevic uh, in 99 on the basis of what is still quite a tendentious international legal law position, uh, tautology, forgive me, um, uh, whereby despite where the UN Charter comes from, which is the absolute inviolability of the sovereign state, if something is going on which is so awful within the boundaries of, a, of a, whichever sovereign state, um, the, the requirement for humanitarian, of action on humanitarian grounds is greater than that in by, I can't say it anymore, uh, of, of the sovereign state. Now, it's a contentious point in international law, and you can find lawyers, you can always find lawyers who take different views. Um, but the point I make, and it's often forgotten, because it, 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 you see it you so often about Iraq, 
that Kosovo, which by and large, my impression was, this country, and much more widely approved of the action, was, was undertaken without a UN Security Council resolution. Uh, and um, uh, en passant, it's interesting, is it not, in these difficult times, that both in Bosnia and in Kosovo, um, treasure was spent and blood was spent on behalf of beleaguered Muslim populations. Just, I just make that point en passant. Um, now let's come to Iraq. Um, no UN Security Council resolution per se in the politics of the day. You'll recall all the fuss about the so-called second resolution. It would have been, I think, the 17th or 18th resolution, uh, which required Saddam Hussein to do this or that. And um, uh, having had a small part to play in putting Milosevic into his cell in The Hague, I've no wish to be his next door neighbour. So um, one took a bit of care on personal grounds uh, to, to look at this. There are three crucial UN Security Council resolutions. 678, which was the reaction to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait which authorized um, all necessary means, uh, UN coy speak for force, uh, to evict him. 687, which was the UN blessing, put that in inverted commas, the ceasefire agreement reached after the eviction of the Iraqi forces from, from Kuwait. But 687 acknowledged, and the wording is there, that it was a ceasefire. This was not a peace settlement. This was a ceasefire. And it was conditional. It was conditional on Saddam Hussein doing the following, uh, completing the following obligations. And there's ten dozen of them, maybe more, um, which he singularly failed to do over a decade. And then 1441, which, which locked those two together and said, you know, you're, you're drinking in last chance saloon. Um, now, the so-called second resolution to me was pure politics of the day. This man had been in defiance of the United Nations. And it's interesting that people say, well, we need a resolution. I say, well, you've got 17 of them. How many more? Uh, was in defiance.